Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for, for joining uh, today's R Adoption Series. Um, we're really excited to talk about um, metadata uh, and metadata for, for speedy delivery. So exciting topic, and I think we have two exciting demos uh, to be able to talk about that uh, today. So quick, just a little housekeeping uh, up front. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the, the scope of some of the uh, of the R adoption series. So obviously it's aimed at, at all those who are, are leading R adoption, but it's open to uh, to everyone. We really like to focus on the the how to of the uh, of our adoption as well as um, technical demos or whatever it, it might be. Typically, our format is uh, pr a presentation um, with some sort of focused discussion at the end. And then finally, we like to host those website or those uh, webinar videos on our our consortium website, um, and have included the link in the um, uh, in this kind of in this uh, intro slide. Um, a quick uh, a little bit about today's session. So we'll have a, a quick opening, uh, which we'll be able to get through um, very fast. Uh, fast. Then we'll be going into two presentations on on metadata. So the first one will be from Christina Fillmore from GSK, focusing on MetaCore and MetaTools and how to leverage meta metadata for data set creation using R. And then we'll have a presentation on uh, MetaLite from uh, Yuji Zhao and Kiwi Anderson from, um, from Merck about leveraging metadata for analysis and reporting based on Atom da data sets. So it will be, I think, great presentations and, and, and demos as well, as well. And then at the end, we'll have some time for any discussion and questions that that might come up. Um, so before we get into those, um, in, into that first um, presentation, big thanks again, as always, to our sponsors, uh, the R Consortium, uh, Fuse and MPSI. Um, you know, without their sponsorship, we weren't, wouldn't be able to, to, to make this happen. And yeah, so excited about today's uh, conversation. So we will go over to initially to um, Christina uh, around leveraging metadata for data set creation using R uh, with MetaCore and MetaTools. So over to Christina. Hi. Um, so can you guys see my screen? I assume so. I can see it now. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about today about leveraging metadata for data set creation with R. Um, so for data set creation, there are kind of two common places you get metadata from, or depending on where your process is internally, you're kind of going to get the data set specifications, which are probably the most common, what everyone's used to. Um, and then also the define XML, which kind of contains a lot of the same information, just in a different format that we end up giving to the FDA, right? So both of these tools are kind of really rich in things um, that are going to make uh, helpful to create a data set, right? Like they're meant to help programmers create the data set by providing the metadata that's needed. Um, things like which variables go in which data set, what the control terminology should be, if there are any labels, all of that sort of stuff. But once it comes to taking that you know, flat Excel file of the spec specification document or the XML file of the define, there's not really, there hasn't really been a great way of getting that into your R environment to start using. So that's kind of the purpose of MetaTools is to, or MetaCore, sorry. MetaCore takes all of that information and we provide some readers as well, but also other companies write their own internal readers, um, depending on what your specification looks like to pull everything in, like pull of all of that metadata in and put it in a standard form that makes it easy to use. So the MetaCore object is made up of a series of seven tables with the first kind of these top ones. Uh, the first one being about the data sets itself. So which data sets there are, how many, their names, their labels, their specifications, their stations, stuff like that. Then there's kind of a combination of data sets and variable information. Then there's the information that's just about the variables themselves, the value level information, the code lists, derivations, and then also a SEP to kind of help you um, put some information specific to SEP variables so that they can be built um, and SEPs so that SEPs can be built as well as um, uh, added into the data sets once they've kind of been when you need to combine them again. Um, so that's 
Metacore. And that's really super helpful, except for Metacore really is a package that creates this object um, and has some readers in it, but it doesn't really do anything with this metadata. So we built a companion package called MetaTools, which really does the like interesting stuff with this information. So it's really looking at trying to action and build out some of the actions that you would want to have on the metadata available within your Metacore object. Um, so that's kind of the general high level view of these two packages that work together to try and really leverage this metadata to go forward. But now let's just talk about it. So we're gonna use this specification to read in, which is kind of a Pinnacle 21 type specification. Um, and it has some data sets in it. And we're gonna use this in order to build um, to build a little example ADSL document uh, data set. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna read everything in here and we're gonna read in our Metacore object. Um, oops. So the Metacore object, you have two options. You can read it in with quiet equals true or not quiet equals true. So if you don't have quiet equals true, it just reads it in, it says you've successfully imported and then it will give you potentially a variety of warning messages or not. So here it's saying things like the sub flag is missing. Um, it's just missing values. And like ID var is missing values. And this all makes sense because my specification document didn't have anything about subs. So they're not there. So that's why that's all missing. And then it also tells me some information that I have here that says like, oh, these derivations were never used anywhere. In other words, I have derivations in my derivation column that weren't ever applied to any variables. So it gives you kind of some helpful warning messages that basically say your specification doesn't really hold together as like, fully cohesive, um, but you might not want to see those all the time. And so you can set quiet equals true so that we don't have to see them. And then it just, uh, I can't spell today. Um, there we go. Um, and when you do that, it just says that it was successfully imported with some suppressed warnings. Um, but that's all you have to do in order to read in a specification. If it's a standard specification, you might need to build your own uh, readers if you're from a company that has their own specification type that's unlike anything that's here. Um, and that's totally fair. So then the next step I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just also read in the DM data, um, but that just uses Haven. There's nothing fancy about that. So let's look at the Metacore object for a second here. So the Metacore object, says that it, uh, if you print it out, it says that it is a Metacore object and that it contains three data sets, which matches what we saw within the specifications, right? So if we look at those three data sets by looking at that DS spec or the data set spec table, to access that DS spec table, all you need to do is have a dollar sign to DS spec. Um, so kind of standard R nomenclature that you would expect. Um, and you can see that there's the three data sets, the ADAE, ADSL, and ADPFT. And then it tells you the structure of them and the label that's for, the, for those. Great, that makes a lot of sense. We can also look at the var spec, which this one, like I said, the var spec just deals with variables. So it gives you the variable, the length, the label, the type, format, and common, whether it's like a common across a bunch of different ones. Um, so all of those, would probably kind of make sense, hopefully. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is we want to try and build an ADSL. So we're going to build out the ADSL table or data set really quickly. Um, so we're going to just subset so that it only has the one data set, the ADSL data set, because that's the, we only need the specs for ADSL to build ADSL. So now if we look at the ADSL spec here, it just says that it contains one data set and that one data set will be ADSL. So if we wanted to look at the ADSL spec, um, if you look at like the DS spec here, you can see it now only has ADSL. Great. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just check what variables I need to build. Um, and it says that I have a log list here of all of these variables that I need to build in my fairly short amount of time that I have to display here for you. So first step is I'm gonna pull through all of those 
um, predecessor variables. Oftentimes variables, especially in Atom data sets, are really built off of just a bunch of predecessors and you're adding in a couple of things, but maybe you're not adding in too much. Um, I've cheated and made the spec myself, so it's largely um, predecessor variables. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this function from meta tools called um, build from derived. So I'm gonna build these out and it's gonna take my ADSL spec, it's gonna take that meta core object, um, and then a list of data sets, a named list, and whether we wanna keep them or not. Here we do. Um, and so if I run this, I now get a fully built out data set. This looks pretty good. This already pulls in 13 columns for me and merges everything across and matches everything up. So that makes my life super easy. Here I knew because I built this that it all came from DM, but in the case that you didn't know where the, what data sets you should be using in order to build your data set, you can also always just do this and it will tell you, hey, you didn't pass me any data and you need to pass me DM. So great. So we've passed in DM now we're able to have the ADSL that's just built off the predecessors. So if we go back to check the variables again, we now see we have a much shorter list. Great. Okay, so let's now start doing another data set or another variable. Let's just start with sex n. So sex n is if we can get the control terminology that's used to build sex n um, by using git control terminology. This lives in Metacore and it will tell you what the control terminology for SexN is from that Metacore object. So great, we know that's one, two, F and M. It's kind of what we predicted, right? And if you see, if you look here in ADSL pred, you can see we already have sex. So we actually just need to be doing the code decode kind of mapping like you would do potentially in SAS using kind of an input or a put statement. Um, we can do the same thing. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to have it call the um, function create var from code list that this lives within meta tools. And we're going to pass the data set and the specification and the input variable, i.e. the variable that is already in your data set, in this case sex, and the variable we want to create. So it will use the control terminology from sex n in order to figure out how to create that. And so if we run that, we can see that the M's got converted to twos and the F's got converted to ones because that's what the control terminology said to do. So great. Now we can do that for a whole bunch of variables. If you look at the variable list of the things we had to make, actually a lot of these sex N, F N, race N, all of them are just based off of kind of converting that control terminology inf information. So great. So we can do that super easy, dead quick. So now you can see I've gone from having just 13 variables to 21 variables where each one of these rows makes that new variable, whether it be sex n, f n, or, you know, treatment 01 pn. Um, so cool, that's good. Um, we can look back at what we still have to build. So if we look at our git control, to, or oops, if we look back at the variables, um, do, 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 do. We can call that um, check variable function again. Let's see what's left. So if we take it, if we um, put in ADSL decode, and then we're gonna call the ADSL spec, which is what we named our like subsetted metaphor object. It will say we only have two variables left to make, the age group and the age group end. Great, cool. So the age group comes from, is special because it's subgrouping the age category, the age column. So we're just creating subgroups out of a kind of continuous variable. So if you look at the control terminology for age group, you can see that there are almost equations, but not quite equations. They're kind of helpful, but not perfect. Um, and thankfully, there's a function in MetaTools called create cat var, which creates those categorical variables from a continuous. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna supply the data set like usual and the Metacore object, same as we did up here, but now we're gonna provide a reference variable, in this case, age, as well as the thing we want to create, which is age group. And when you do that, 
you're it, it's able to convert the control terminology that looks like this into kind of actual actionable kind of if else statements behind the scene. And so now you can see that the age gets converted into the correct grouping. 67 is between 65 and 80, 85, uh, 58 is less than 65, and so on and so forth, so forth down to 84, which is greater than 80. So you're able to get all of those pieces without having to do too much because someone in the spec at the point you were writing it in the specification, someone wrote it out in a kind of equation-like way that made it so that you're able to do this. Perfect. So when the other thing that is nice is that with this um, create cat variable, you can also get the numeric as well. In this case, we need both age group and age group n. So we can just create both. Um, and if we look at our data set here, we can see doo -doo -doo, that both the age group one and age group one n got created from just that single call um, that was able to split out and do the kind of if else statements from age for you so you didn't have to think about it. And now if we check and look at our um, check variables again, it looks like we have no missing or extra variables. We are good to go. Perfect. So the kind of last couple of things that you might want to be doing with these metadata is being able to kind of order the columns, add the labels, and to do all of the kind of final steps, the things that you need to do in order to write it out to an XPT. Um, and so we're going to First, we're going to order the columns. That might just make sure that they're set in order of what the specification says. And then we're going to set the variable labels. So now, if we look at ADSL, we can see that study ID has that label of study identifi identifier, and U subject ID is labeled as unique subject ID, and so on and so forth, all the way down. Um, so that's great. Now, before we want to be really done, oftentimes you want to do some checks and things like that. And so you're going to be able, you're going to want to be able to do things like check that your control terminology is correct across your data set, as well as check that the variables you have. We've already checked the variables both times, so we know we're good. But you do that, and you're able to see that both under check control terminology and check variables produces no missing extra data, and basically. How all these checks work is if you if it fails if it, if you have a variable you shouldn't for instance um, like if we add mutate um, new var equals foo foo oops whoa um. We can see that that will make it throw a tantrum, um, which is what you want. It says that you shouldn't have that variable in there. It doesn't belong. It needs to get out. Um, and equally, if you have control terminology that's incorrect, it will also fall over. So it does not a nice job of telling you what's gone wrong. Um, and really, that's kind of the purpose of it, is to help you do those automated tasks that are kind of boring but fairly easy to autom automate, like that control terminology conversion, while also helping you make sure that the data set you've created matches the spec specifications, whether it's the orders or the order or the label are correct, or that you have the right control terminology. You want to make sure all of that works together. So really, that is how Metacore works today, um, and MetaTools, and how they work together in order to help quickly make a data set. I mean, we've made this ADSL data set, which, OK, it's not the fanciest ADSL data set in the whole wide world, but it is 23 columns. And we made it fairly quickly. And it's not something we probably could have done if we didn't have, if I didn't have all of this. I'd have to spend ages writing ifs and else statements to get all of this control terminology pulled through. And that's much riskier for me as a person to write when you want it to match as much as possible to the specifications or what's in your define. And so to do that, it's easier if it's just automatically done for you. So there's no chance for human error. Um, so that's Metacore and Metatools. I think I'm going to hand off to uh, Yuji.
Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yujie. I'm a senior scientist from work uh, in the methodology research group. And today I uh, also have my manager, Kevin Anderson, here. Uh, we will present, uh, today we will present a powerful tool uh, using the metadata approach uh, to, uh, for in clinical trials for analysis and reporting. Let me first share my screen. So today the package I want to introduce is MetaLite, and this R package can uh, transform the Adam data set in clinical trials into metadata. And then we can use this metadata for analysis and reportings. And first of all, I would like to declare that everything I introduced in today's presentation as a variable in GitHub. And I will introduce three packages, MetaLite, MetaLite AE, and Forestly. And all these three packages are open source in GitHub. And we have very wonderful package down website for these three R packages, where there are rich documentations for you to read and learn. So, um, First, I would like to give you a high-level story about MetaLite. We know like in clinical trials, we have a lot of raw data. They can either come from data management warehouse or SDTM or some additional data source. And later on, this raw data will be transformed into our atom data. And this atom data is what, what we usually use for analysis and reporting in clinical trials. And for our proposed MetaLite R package, we will focus on the right-hand side where we assume we already have the atom data set. And given the atom data set, uh, we can use the package called MetaLite to transform the atom data into metadata. And in my rest presentations, I will give you a concrete examples how these transformations can be done. And given this metadata, we then can use meta can, can use this metadata for some documentation purpose. For example, creating ANR grid validation tracker or some submission documents. And this documentation purpose can also be realized by using the package MetaLite because MetaLite contains some help functions for documentations. And I will also show you uh, some simple examples on the creation of ANR grid. In addition to the documentations, we can also use this metadata for TLF deliverables. For example, if we are interested in some AE tables, then we can use metalite.ae to generate a summary AE specific tables. And if we are interested in lab data, then we can use metalite LB to generate these tables. And here, this MetaLite AE R package is matured and ready for you to use. And we are still developing MetaLite LB and MetaLite SL for the future case. And in my presentations, I will also introduce an example how to use this metadata to build some AE tables. And finally, this metadata can also be used to generate some interactive report. For example, we can generate interactive forest plot, and we can also generate interactive box plot. And in my presentations, I will take the forest plot as an illustration example to show you the magic of this metadata. 
So without further ado, let me first introduce how to transform atom data into metadata. Basically, uh, to build a metadata, we need to go through, uh, through uh, four steps. In the first step, we need to do some initializations about this metadata. So we need to tell uh, the population data set and the observation data set. And in these examples, we use some public clinical trial atom data set. And we assume the population is ADSL data set and the observation is ADAE data set. And after feeding in the population and the observations, we then create some statistical analysis plans. And in my toy is examples, I assume we have two examples. One is AE summary and the other is AE specific. So I I, I develop the first analysis plan by using the function called plan. And I tell like, uh, this is the AE analysis, what is the population and the observations? What is the parameters I want to report? And when I add another plans, I use this pipe operators and use another function called add plan. So this uh, two analysis plans can be add on like a layer to another layer following the logic in ggpro2. And it is more reader friendly for you to review and reproduce in the futures. And after define the analysis plans, we just feed in the analysis plans into the metadata. And after feeding the uh, analysis plans, the key question is, we have defined a lot of the keywords in the analysis plan, for example, what is AE summary? What is APAT? What is week 12 and what is week 24? And what is any related series means? We define a lot of keywords, but we haven't uh, defined the scope of these parameters. So in step four, we need to define all the keywords in the metadata. For example, I started defining the population keywords, APAT. It should be the safety flag equals to yes. And I also assume like the two observation keywords, week 12 and week 24 will be uh, the subset safety flag equals to yes and uh, AOCC01F flag equals to yes, respectively. And I further define the keywords in the analysis. For example, what is REL? We know REL stands for uh, drug-related AE, right? So we define like AE, uh, REL is AE-related either equals to possible or probable. And the similar story happens to AE OSI and other keywords, AE summary and AE specific. And after defining all the keywords, we now can build this metadata by just running a function called MetaBuild. And in this way, uh, you will uh, get a metadata. I, let me see if I can get an example to show you what this metadata looks like. This is our package down website and we all the material are here for you to learn. So this is what this metadata looks like. So it will tell you fir first, uh, what is the observation and the population data set? How many subjects and how many records do you have? And besides, tell, it tells you how many analysis you have because the analysis is corresponding to the RTF tables. And furthermore, it gives you some details about the populations. 
for example, it tells you like APAT uh, is safety equals to yes, and the label is all patient uh, as treated. And it also tells you uh, the details about the observations and all the details about uh, the key parameters like related AEOSI, any, et cetera. And finally, uh, it tells you uh, how many analysis functions you have. And in our examples, we assume there are two analysis, A summary and A specific. So the analysis functions only covers the two, these two. Okay. So this, this is how we build the metadata from the Adam data. And after building the metadata, we then can use this metadata for these three purposes. Uh, first, let's see how to use metadata to generate ANR grid. So the generation of ANR grid is very, very simple. So this is a section of creating ANR grid. So basically, uh, it is like uh, we assume this ANR grid has four columns. The first column is the RTF table titles. And to get all the titles, we can use this spec titles to play on the metadata. And you will get all the RTF titles automatically. And furthermore, for the second column, we want to know like the um, RTF file name. And to get this file name, you can use this help function called the spec file name, and you will get these file names accordingly. And the third column is a function name. And in our uh, meta light, we assume all the analysis is done by R. So this function name basically is a R function. And the last column will be the populations. And if you use the function spec analysis population, then it will automatically tell you the population subset and the observation subset used to generate this specific RTF. And in this way, you can generate a very simple uh, ANR grid. And if you want to get uh, more columns to this ANR grid or more details, please feel free to play with all the functions beginning with SPEC because this is all the help functions we implemented in this package to help you get some documentation purpose. And after introducing the documentation of MetaLite, then let's take a look at an example how to use metadata to generate some uh, AE tables. Uh, assume like we already have uh, this metadata built. And uh, with this metadata, you only need to go through, go through two steps. The first step is to, is to call the format AE summary. And in this example, I assume uh, we focus on the generation of AE summary tables. So this the format AE summary function basically is to tell like how many digits you want to display for this percent, uh, proportions. And, and after getting all the format AE summaries, you then we need to call another function called TLF AE summary. And this TLF AE summary basically is to tell like, first, what, what is the text you want to add at the bottom of these tables? And also where you want to save these RTF tables. And if after you applying these two functions to our metadata, then you will get uh, a summary tables similar like this ones. And please note that 
this fun, uh, these tables are 100% generated by R, and we also verify uh, the output by R with that in SAS, and they match. So we can, the validation work is done and the R analysis is accurate. And you can also use a similar procedure to generate AE specific tables, just call like format AE specific as a TLF AE specific. And also there are some details. Uh, so for example, like uh, if I want to adjust some column wise of this RTF tables, I can add more details of this TLF AE summaries, and I can either like also enlarge the font size of these tables and the orientations of these tables, etc. So it uh, gives you a lot of the cosmetic costumes you can play with. And another fancy thing is that we can also generate a mock-up tables. So here, like if you if you here address the argument mock equals to two, then everything will be masked with this x sign and it will give you a mock-up tables. Okay. And this is uh, an example of using metadata to build some analysis tables, like AE tables. And uh, uh, here I would also give you another examples on the metadata to get some interactive reports. Let's take the forest plot as the examples. So here is a story how we create uh, interactive forest plot. So we assume we already have a metadata already built here. And to get a, a, a forest plot, you only need to go through three steps. The first one is to prepare a forest, right? And, and the, uh, the, in this part, uh, you need to tell like which population and observations you want to use to generate this AE forest plot. And you also need to specify the parameters. Uh, please note that uh, these three parameters will finally be uh, uh, passed on to this AE criteria. So basically uh, here we have any AE, drug related AE and a serious AE. So in this select list, you will have any AE, drug-related AE, and a serious AE. And if I click drug-related AEs, these tables be, will be automatically updated. Uh, and all these uh, AEs listed here is a drug-related AE. And if you choose another like serious AEs, then we only have two serious AE listed here. But, and if, for example, you are interested in other uh, criteria like AE, OSI, or grade three to five, you can add more parameters here. So you will get a enlarged selection list here. And after prepare AE forest, you need to go through the second step is format AE forest. And this is basically to tell like the column wise of this forest plot and the font size of this forest plot, etc. And the last, uh, last function is AE forest, which is to display this AE forest plot. And after getting these three steps, you will get an AE forest plot uh, like this one. And in this AE forest plot, the first column here is uh, AE events. 
and we have the AE proportions, the risk difference, and all the numerical details here. And for this forest plot, it has very fancy interactive features. For example, if you hovering your mouse over all this point, uh, the numerical lab labels will be displayed. And uh, also it will show you the details of these confidence intervals. And another interactive feature is that we have a triangle button. And if you uh, click this triangle button, it will show you all the subject details who are experiencing, uh, experiencing this AEs. And here we uh, present like the site number, the patient ID, gender, race, et cetera, for illustration purpose. Uh, but if you are interested in displaying more subject details or less, uh, it, can be auto uh, it can be also costumed by yourself. So in this ways, we can get some AE listing details in this AE forest project. And also we have uh, an, the third interactive feature is we have a search bar here. So for example, if I'm interested in uh, AE with the keywords ping, then like I can enter these keywords and it will automatically filter out the AE with this keywords pane. So in this way, like maybe the clinicians can find anything they are interested. And also a, a very powerful uh, interactive feature is this slide bar. So here like uh, the default, we will play, display all the AE with every in any number of index. And if you are interested in like uh, AE, for example, with the index like larger than 8% or 7%, you can just play with this slide bar and it will automatically filter out the AE whose index is larger than seven. And uh, also you can select different AEs you are interested in, either drug-related or serious AEs, et cetera. So this is a very powerful tool for us to uh, get all the details in one single plot. And this is a story of uh, our MetaLite approach. Uh, to catch up, we have pack this atom data into metadata and then this metadata can be either used for some documentation purpose or generate RTF deliverables or generate some interactive uh, plot. And uh, uh, at the end of my presentations, I would like to uh, like to mention some of the key advantage of MetaLite. So first, uh, our tool is an end-to-end -to -end tool because it starts uh, from defining, like defining the observation and the population data set, and it ends with deliverables of RTF. So it covers uh, all the steps in software development life cycles. And the second key feature is its automations. A function call is always better than a checklist. So we can have like ANR grade and also like the R, fun R analysis functions together instead of separate them in like Excel files and in such micros. And the third key feature is its traceabilities. All the analysis record can be easily traced let me show you a little more details. Recall that when we define the metadata, we have a lot of the keywords. And after 
the definition of metadata, we may somehow forget some of the keywords we just defined. But it doesn't matter because um, you can always get the definition of your keywords by using the function called the clat add mapping. In these functions, first you input your metadata and then you search the keywords for example, I forgot what is APAT means. So I search this APAT and it will show you like, oh, this is all patient as treated. And the scope is uh, safety flag equals to yes. And you can also search for another keywords. For example, what is SER? Is it just uh, uh, drug related serious AEs or just a serious AEs? I just forgot. And you can search for this keyword by using this function called cloud add mapping, and it will show you all the details. It is serious AEs, and the scope is AESER equals to yes. So it uh, it will not be a big problem if you forgot any details about your metadata definitions, and everything can be traced. And another key feature of the metadata is its single entries. Uh, we only need to enter or define the keywords in one place. And after that, this downstream change in metadata will be automatically passed to the downstream in analysis. And here is the examples. So here, like we assume, like previously, we are interested in APAT populations, where the safety flag equals to yes. But now we don't want to analysis APAT populations. We want to uh, analysis uh, ITT populations. So we just uh, switch from the APAT keywords to this ITT keywords and define these ITT words as uh, ITT flag equals to yes, and label it as intention to treat. And then if we def define, update the up metadata, then all the analysis downstreams will be adopted automatically to the ITT population rather than the old APAT populations. So in this way, you don't need to update the ANR grid manually one place by another place. You only need to uh, change one place and we will automatically, automatically do the synchronize for you. Yeah, that's, that's all for my introduction of MetaLight and uh, Kevin, do, do you have any closing comments? Okay. Um, first of all, both of these presentations were really awesome, and I hope people enjoyed them as much as I did. Um, several years ago, I, I went to a short course that Frank Harrell from Vanderbilt gave, and he, he was working on data monitoring committee um, reports that were interactive and very visual, but with the ability to, um, you know, drill down on patients to basically make your um, data monitoring um, committee members much more efficient in, in doing their review. Um, and so uh, UJ, along with our colleague, um, Yilong Zhang, uh, have worked with this to do um, an initial safety data monitoring committee report that, that's interactive. And one thing that's really cool about it is um, that it doesn't um, share the data sets. It just has the ability within HTML to go through a lot of the things that UG has, has 
shown you. So all the review com review committee mem members need is uh, a browser and an HTML file that we can share with them. So it it is um, pretty awesome. And so, you know, in terms of our strategy at, at Merck, kind of the, the next thing we're thinking about is some larger scale reporting where we're doing a lot of modeling for uh, health technology assessment. And uh, it was decided that those analyses um, would be best run in R for, uh, you know, partly because of the package and capability availability and partly for other reasons. But that provides us um, a bigger kind of production stage to see is this something that's really going to have a big impact on us potentially. You know, otherwise, Merck is, is still at a stage where I think we're thinking a lot about automation and trying different things, um, but we don't have uh, kind of an end-to-end -end coherent, here's, here's where our biggest syntheses are and, um, you know, where, where we're really going to focus. So I think there are still opportunities to do that. And um, uh, in any case, maybe a, a question or two before we open up more broadly. Um, just, uh, Christina, um, one thing, uh, you know, if somebody um, in, in my group says, well, why would I use meta tools in Metacore? Couldn't I do the same thing in SAS? Do you have any comments on, on that question? Yeah, so um, like the one comment is that while SAS does some of this, potentially SAS plus other systems do things like checking control terminology or those slightly more complicated derivations um, in terms of like calculating subgroups. Um, so that's one reason. Also, unlike SAS, this is an open source tool. Um, so like I am the maintainer of Metacore and MetaTools, but uh, I'm just the maintainer. I'm not necessarily like, if there's a thing that you want to see that you're like, I would like this automation that makes sense to automate using this metadata, um, just put in a pull request and I will review it and I will probably accept it. And then you will have that thing and everybody wins. Yeah. Um, so like, it's a little bit more of the like, we all work together on the, like when it comes to specifically the metadata that I cover with the stuff that's in the define because it's in a define that is required by the FDA it's fairly standardized at this point um and so there is a I feel like a lot of opportunity to easily find more easy wins within that metadata um and to build out more and more tools and the more that we can have standard tools that everyone can use you guys at Merck us at GSK, like everybody and and like even the FDA when they're reviewing it, I think the better we're going to be rather than having to rely on like internal SAS macros where like the FDA has to spend more time reviewing that because like an internal macro, it's not like something they can be using regularly where if we're all using standard tools and standard R packages, we all kind of can, a rising tide raises all boats kind of argument here. Um, but that's, I would say, it's a fair comment to say a lot of the things that are currently available in Metacore and Metatools are kind of what you can do in SAS already. So there's not a huge advantage over doing it in SAS, but it really just opens the door to if you want to develop a data set in R using like Admiral and some of the other packages that are out there, this will help. Great. Thank you. And so do you have uh, any, um, what, what kind of collaboration group do you have both internally and externally? So um, Metacore is under a Taurus. So tech, like, so a Taurus and um, Mike Sackhouse and I were, and um, a woman called Maya uh, were kind of the main developers on it. Um, at this point, it's mostly me, myself, and I. So I would love collaborators. If someone is very interested in this, please contact me. I would love that so much. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we are part of the Pharmaverse. So it's part of the general Pharmaverse collaboration. Um, so kind of 
I have been speaking to people with like, I know that Roche is starting to use the tool as well. Um, and so they're starting to adopt it for their needs. Um, and so other than like general conversations with Roche and others, kind of just me and um, also with Mike. So, so that's those packages, but Jen, like I have had, um, I can't remember his name. Someone did do a pull request in to, to, to add some more functionality, I think to medical tools, which I accepted and that's got pulled in. So it's more of an ad hoc than formal, um, yeah. like partnership, but, uh, yeah, we will, I would love more help and ideas if there's anyone who would like to add something to this that they feel like, oh, this thing is missing. And I think it could really add a lot of value. Right. Yeah. And I, I guess I uh, went in my package development, I probably tend, would tend to suggest people submit issues rather than pull requests, but that, that may be partly subject matter driven, but so. I, I accept I, all things. I accept yeah. issues. I accept well, pull requests, right. whatever you feel comfortable with. Well, right. um, Presumably you might get emails too. Um, I get emails. I get messages on LinkedIn. Um, so it's a combination of Slack. We're very active. The So Metacore and Metatools are part of Pharmaverse. And so they have their own Slack channels within the Pharmaverse Slack. Um, so that is a, another option for how to message me if you would like to. I have many channels of communication and I accept them all. <laughs> um, well, that's awesome. Um, so, um, and... Um, you know, um, oh, for you, Jeff, for those who, uh, I, I don't know if everybody's f familiar with Plotly. So uh, everything that ends with L-Y, if it looks like a curious uh, wording, it's just because those are interactive plots, right? Yeah, we borrow a lot of ideas from Pod Prodly, and we name our like forest prod the package called Forestly, so we can like uh, follow in a very similar naming conventions as Prodly's. Yeah, and you know it's just awesome to get the interactivity that you you might yes. not get elsewhere. That's just a huge advantage of R. Um, you know, I have other things I, I could bring up, this stuff uh, I could talk about all day and all night, but maybe I should, um, Ben, were you gonna say anything or do we have any other questions? Um, yeah, so I think there were a couple questions through the comments um, and I wanted to hit a couple admin questions and then uh, a couple presentation specific questions. So in terms of admin questions, uh, our plan is to post the presentations on the R Consortium website. Um, in terms of accessing code, that was a, a pretty common question. Uh, and I think Andy Nichols posted that um, Metacore Meta Tools is open source. He posted the links as well as posted links to the to the code that Metacore, Chris went through. Metacore and Meta Tools are both also on CRAN. Um, we expect a new release relatively soon due to some tidy select updates. But other than that, they're like CRAN or GitHub, both of them are available. Yeah, Sorry, Ben. Yeah, no worries. Um, and then um, there was an open question about experience with regulatory agencies uh, for self-contained code. So uh, suggestion would be to go to the previous uh, webinar uh, where the FDA spoke a lot about that. So that would be a, a good webinar to, to check out. Um, for the presentation specific questions, um, for, your, for you, Christina, there was one from uh, uh, Pavel, and he basically wanted to confirm that it would be possible to drive um, basic derivation of code decode pairs dynamically from a read and spec. So, like, could you leap through and create a, a var from code list without writing the code using meta, uh, Metacore and Metatools? Yes. So, uh, let's see. So, it, sorry. With Metacore and Metatools, at the moment, there's not a functionality that just says, like, do them all. Um, like, that's not currently in there, but you could theoretically write that. Um, and there's there's no, nothing stopping you. Um, if you want to write that, add that in. Great. Um, but, um, yeah, so, so we don't currently have functionality that will do all of the dynam dynamic pairs. If you provide a, like, list of, like, here's all the dynamic pairs, 
you could easily also use something like map two in order to, or maybe not quite map two, but you could definitely make it happen in R very easily. Perfect. Um, and then for you, Yuji, uh, maybe Kevin, you would know this as well. There was a question about uh, if modules for lab data, et cetera, are, are on the, the horizon uh, for, for um, Metalite. Yeah, for the lab data, it is still under the development. And uh, currently, we take the AE data as the illustration examples. And the development in lab data will follow in a very similar procedure. OK, perfect. We'll see where it goes. But you know, it, it, it would be wonderful to be much more comprehensive in this. Um, but that you know would have to be prioritized. And I think also if people were interested in collaborating in this general area, uh, you know, please reach out and we can consider it. We haven't uh, done that so much so far, but this is obviously potentially of a lot of interest. And um, I, I generally have the attitude, like Christina, that we're better off with open source collaboration to get acceptance at places like um, regulatory agencies um, and, and elsewhere. Awesome. Um Great. So I haven't seen any other questions in the comments section. So uh, I guess to the audience, if you have any questions, uh, please put it in the comments. Um, and while we give some people uh, time, just in case there are questions, I did have a question for for the presenters. Um, and it's kind of a, I don't know if inspirational is the right, <laughs> right, question, uh, right way to phrase it, but are there any parts of the kind of the clinical delivery that could use metadata uh, that's currently not using metadata that you think is an interesting problem uh, to solve uh, for, for speeding up clinical delivery? I have uh, a... Go for it, Christina. Okay, I'm going to jump in. I have some thoughts. Um, so one thought is within kind of the metadata space that I've talked about today around um, derivations potentially because the way that we do derivations today and define XMLs Kind of just loose text format it's pretty hard to build automation off of them today but if we could make them more of a rigid slightly rigid not too rigid but um metadata driven format you could definitely get a lot of easy wins i think from that um and then another place is actually when it comes to displays um so we at gsk have another package called t format which really is looking at generating tables based off of metadata um, not doing the analysis, so it doesn't do quite what um, UG presented here. It really just does the displays only of taking what an ARD or this analysis results data sets that um, the CDISC, CDISC is starting to kind of push as like a new data standard um, and building displays off of those. So that's like another place that I would, that I find interesting. Um, and I think there's a lot of chance for speed so that you, people don't have to spend time formatting spaces, et cetera, et cetera, so. Yeah, I mean, my my dream would be, you know, you've got metadata, you can use it to generate, you know, an overall plan for what you want to report in a study, which may be a very different layout than, than some other tools. Um, you know, we have, say, PowerPoint tool that does that at a high level. And so that without looking at a big pile of PDF mockups, uh, people can see kind of, OK, how much are we putting in our submission and where are we putting it? Uh, do we have all the content we want? Is it a gazillion tables or, you know, uh, 200 tables? Are you using standards? Are you? making a lot of custom things and then you know from that and i think a lot of the basis is here you know you can if if you need specs generated for your internal processes you can do that if you need um review plans for for uh, checking and validation you can do that if you need to generate code and tables you can do that um and then the obvious 
interactivity so that, you know, in the future, presumably, um, you know, you're doing the thinking about subject matter as opposed to details of implementation so that, you know, that's presumably where we all want to go. But, um, you know, this, these kinds of tools are, I think, a great move in that direction. Yeah, Perfect. and I, I agree, like, um, from my personal experience assisting the clinical trials, we always find it, like the clinical trials, at least for the RTF, there are a lot of the updates going on. And when there are some updates, the programmers and the statisticians need to update the ANR grade, also the spec, and then rerun the tables. So there are a lot of the uh, repeated work there. And sometimes we just forgot to update one single files. And this small mistake may cause a lot of confusions for the uh, statisticians or the programmers when they review the old files. And uh, so our high level plan is to get, if we can get everything automatically realized by R, and which can save a lot of the manually entry um, data. Uh, we, we can save a lot of lab the time and effort from pro both programmers and the statisticians. Awesome. Um, so it looks like we had a question come in um, from, from Andy Nichols. Um, so a question to the presenters. Um, in your experience, how are companies tending to store the metadata outside of R? Is it in a database, Excel? And do you think the surrounding infrastructure we have is mature enough to support uh, metadata-driven workflows? I'll, I'll take an initial shot at it. Uh, Excel is like so many people's favorite tool. Uh, I wish it weren't, weren't sometimes. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I think we tend to do a lot of documentation and stuff there. Um, and I think the, the question about is the infrastructure mature enough to support metadata driven workflows? Um, I, I, I certainly think it's mature enough to um be working in in that direction and there probably are updates that would be needed but um i wish i understood more about what other companies are doing and if there are enough commonalities you know that building reusable tools like christina and UJ have shown you know could drive that certainly that's where we'd love to go but you know people should also respond to this in the chat, uh, as well as, you know, Ben, you, or Christina commenting. Yeah, I think at GSK, we also, we, we do use a database, but also Excel, because as Ethan said, Excel is everyone's favorite tool. Um, I think that, I mean, Metacore accepts Excel documents in part because they are so common. Um, and, but I think I'm probably of the belief that building small tools that can leverage metadata in workflows or like within code is probably where we're at today as opposed to a fully automated workflow because I just, I, because like Excel is not a great tool for men for putting things in because like there's nowhere to check when you've done it wrong or to be like, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> like none of these things you can't have this over here and this over here. Like you need things that do that automated checking and stuff. So, um, but also it's really easy to use. There's like, oh, it's hard. It's a hard problem of like, just even how you put it in, how do you copy from standards and then edit it? Like, I don't have solutions at all. But um, I think where we are today is like a, probably a hybrid approach, but that doesn't mean we can't get to a fully automated approach in the future. Well, I, I mean, don't you think you should take credit for the fact that once you've gotten it in for, from Excel, 
you've got your intellectual property stored in R, it's checkable there and it's reusable there. Yes. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that that is the purpose of Metacore. I mean, yeah. Metacore has some things where it's like immutable. So it is a little bit of a weird R object. It's not an S3 for those who really love R. Um, but it means that you can't edit it. Um, so you do need to go to source to edit. So we do try to keep things within Metacore. So it's harder to do things you shouldn't. Um, like if things are failing, just removing it from your local version. But that balance between having it central and having it so that everyone can be accessing it, but also having it in your local R session so that you can access it and leverage it is definitely a, it's a tight line to walk. Yeah, and Christina, you know, when you laid out the, um, the different components of, of the metadata, it looked like a relational database. Could you just comment on how much it is and how much it isn't? It's like a fake relational database in my head. Um, so it technically is not. It's it, there's. It's not like a, a little SQL light sort of thing hiding in there. Um, it's it's officially not. But if you were to put it in a relational database, it would be very easy because it it is more or less that structure. Uh, some of the things like the code list are nested tables, um, so it's slightly more complicated. But yeah, you could just you could just put that into a relational database. So it's so it's a good mind map, anyhow. Yeah, I mean that is that is the exact structure of what it looks like. Each the each of those tables does exist in the the data set um, in each data set, and so you can like pull them out and pull them all combined, or pull them out in parts. Um, so that is totally possible, but it's technically yeah. not a relational database. <laughs> Yeah. More on technicalities than on actualities. Right. And Yuji, do you want to comment on the underlying data structures? Or or maybe I saw Yilong commenting or earlier. He may want to put a chat in too. Yeah, for the outdate uh, the metadata structures, it depends on the audience we want to deliver the metadata. So if we want to deliver this metadata to stats or with some with audience who has some programming background, this metadata is very easy for them to read and learn all the details, right? And if we deliver this metadata to the audience who has limited programming background, then I, I prefer not to deliver the metadata. Instead, we deliver some uh, RTF tables or some visualizations of this metadata because like all the numerical details, it's hard to, right. to for them to get all the, right? Oh yeah, but I mean, there's, there's the underlying data structure, but then there's different views of it, which is kind of what you're describing. Yeah. You know, yeah. The, the physician or team planning view, there's a table mock-up view. Um, yes, yes. But then underneath, you have to have all the data structures to support those views. Yes, yes. We The metadata created can be uh, used for different purposes, either like depending on this project going on and the, the business need. But with all the essential data information in this metadata, it can be used to generate any tables or purpose the team needed to display. Yeah. Cool. Um, so it doesn't look like we have uh, any more questions from the audience. Um, so uh, before closing it out, any final thoughts from our presenters, Yuji, Kevin, or, or Christina? All right. Well, I hope I hope other people are uh, equally excited. It, it it was really nice for people to see comments from people that they look like they're interested. So uh, I think both both companies are interested in interacting and talking about these things. Oh, and one other thing. Christina, when you mentioned um, the Taurus, I mean, it is great to feel like there is a company out there that 
you know, presumably um, is is actively engaged in this so that you know other companies can feel like, well, this isn't um, GSK's tool that they can run away and hide with. No, and like meta tools, so I can I can confidently say that like Rosh, GSK, and Datoris are all actively like involved in Metacore. Um, Rosh doesn't do as much of the coding as much as they like tell me I would like this, that, or the other thing, and I do that for them. But yeah. um, like it, it's it's definitely something that they are starting to use um, that they plan to have in their frozen environment from what I hear. Um, so that they, it's, it's definitely something that people are engaging with. Um, and yeah, so if it, if, if you do want to engage with it and your company and you find something isn't working correctly and you need help and just getting help up and running, if you have like weird specs, like feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to help um, as much as I can. All right. Um, cool. So I think we will wrap it up now. So thanks everyone for, for joining the, the webinar. Um, I thought it was really great to see sort of like actual practical uh, demos of how to use metadata within the clinical delivery um, pipeline. And as always, uh, we will post the webinar on the website as well as presentations. Um, and um, just thank you all for joining and hope you found it as um, as interesting as uh, uh, as we did. So thanks for joining and um, hope to see everyone uh, in the future on a on another webinar. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you.